Hey everybody, welcome back. This is the final part in Chapter 15, Psychological Disorders from the OpenStax Online uh, Psychology 2e textbook. Again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at PsychSynced, Succinct Psychology, and I hope you guys will just bear with me here as we finish up the uh, Psychological Disorders. Last time we talked about basis of mood disorders, biological basis, bipolar disorder, uh, persistent anxiety disorder, all this other good stuff. So if you guys haven't seen that video, I recommend go checking it out. But anyways, last time we left off here on the cognitive theories of depression, so we'll just keep on going. So cognitive theories suggest that depression is triggered by negative thoughts, interpretations, self-evaluations, and expectations. The diathesis stress model is cognitive vulnerability plus Oh, we went over this earlier. Whoops. I got really confused. I'm like, that's going to go back in the chapter. Um, cognitive vulnerability plus stress for life events lead to depression. Now, Aaron Beck in the 1960s theorized that depression-prone people possess mental predispositions to think about most things in a negative, negative way, or depressive schemas. Now, a depressive schema contain themes of loss, failure, rejection, worthlessness, and inadequacy. It may develop in childhood in response to adverse experiences and dormant until activated by stressful or negative life events. It may prompt dysfunctional and pessimistic thoughts about the self, world, and the future. And maintained by cognitive biases which lead us to focus on negative aspects of experiences, interpret things negatively, and block positive memories. This is supported by research and lead to the, led to the development of cognitive therapies. So going on, we have the hopelessness theory which is specific negative thinking style leads to a sense of hopelessness, which leads to depression. Uh, negative thinking refers to a tendency to perceive negative life events as having stable, or stable, it's never going to change, and global, it's going to affect my whole life, causes. Uh, it creates a view that the life event will have negative implications for the person's future and self-worth, increasing likelihood of hopelessness. And hopelessness is at the expectation that unpleasant outcomes will occur or desired outcomes will not occur, and there's nothing one can do to prevent such outcomes seen as the primary cause of depression. So we have rumination, which is distressed mood, leads to rumination, which leads to an increased risk and duration of mood. Uh, rumination is the repetitive and passive focus on the fact that one is depressed and dwelling on depressed sim symptoms rather than distracting oneself from the symptoms or attempting to address them in an active problem-solving manner. Described to explain uh, higher rates of depression in women who are more likely to ruminate than in men. Or than in, yeah, in men. So, suicide statistics. 90% of those who complete suicides have a diagnosis, a diagnosis of at least one mental disorder, and is most frequently mood disorders. 10th leading cause of death for all ages in 2010, an average of 105 each day, and four times higher among males, 75% of all suicides, and females. Uh, males most commonly use firearms. Females most commonly use poison. Risk factors. Substance abuse problems, uh, 10 times greater in individuals with alcohol dependence, previous suicide attempts, access to lethal means in which to act, for example, a firearm in a home. Precursors include withdrawal from social relationships, feeling like a burden, engaging in reckless and risk-taking behaviors, sense of entrapment or feeling unable to escape feelings or external circumstances, cyberbullying, suicide of a family member, and serotonin dysfunction. Now, schizophrenia symptoms, hallucinations, perceptual experience that occurs in the absence of external stimulation. Auditory hallucinations are most common. Delusions, beliefs that are contrary to reality, so paranoid delusions or belief that other people or agencies are plotting to harm them. And voice delusions, belief that one holds special power, unique knowledge, or is extremely important. Uh, somatic delusions, belief that something highly abnormal is happening to one's body, thought withdrawal slash insertion, and uh, there, then there's disorganized thinking, which is disjointed and incoherent thought processes, uh, disorganized or abnormal motor behavior, so that's unusual behaviors slash movements, then there's catatonic behaviors, which are decreased reactivity to the environment, then negative symptoms, uh, well, the negative symptoms decreases in absences in certain behaviors, emotions, drives, so these include abolition, which is the lack of motivation to engage in self-initiated initiated and meaningful activity, alogia, which is reduced speech output, and asociality, which is social withdrawal. And then there's uh, anhedonia, or the inability to experience pleasure. And I think I mentioned that in the last video. So causes of schizophrenia. Uh, the prevalence affects 1% of the population. Genetics risk is six times greater if one parent has schizophrenia, even if adopted. Uh, that's interesting. Um, 
neurotransmitters, dopamine hypothesis, an overabundance of dopamine or too many dopamine receptors are responsible for the onset and maintenance of schizophrenia. Uh, drugs that increase dopamine levels can produce schizophrenia-like symptoms, and medications that block dopamine activity reduce the symptoms. High levels of dopamine in the limbic system lead to hallucinations and delusions. Low levels of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex lead to negative symptoms. Now, brain anatomy, uh, enlarged ventricles, reduce gray matter in the frontal lobes, and many show less frontal lobe activity when performing cognitive tasks. Events during pregnancy, uh, obst obstetric complications during birth, uh, the mother's exposure to influenza during the first trimester, or the mother's emotional stress. So these are events that could lead to schizophrenia, these events during pregnancy. Next we have disassociative dis disorders. Disorders characterized by an individual becoming split off or dissociated from their core sense of self, memory, and identity become distributed or disturbed. Disassociative um, amnesia is the inability to recall important personal information, usually follows a stressful or traumatic experience. Uh, the disassociative fugue is individual suddenly wanders away from home, experiences confusion about their identity, and in some cases may adopt a new identity. And there's depersonal depersonalization, derealization disorder. It is characterized by recurring episodes of depersonalization, derealization, or both. Uh, depersonalization is feelings of unreality or detachment from or unfamiliarity with one's whole self or from aspects of the self. Then derealization is a sense of unreality or detachment from or unfamiliarity, unfamiliarity sorry, um, with the world, be it individuals, inanimate objects, or all surroundings. Then we have the disassociative identity disorder, formerly multiple personality disorder. Individual exhibits two or more separate personalities or identities. It involves memory gaps for the time during which another identity is in charge, and individuals tend to report a history of childhood trauma. Ado adoption of multiple personalities may serve as a psychologically important coping mechanism for threat and danger. Going off that, personality disorder is characterized by a pervasive and inflexible personality style that differs markedly from the expectations of the individual's culture and causes distress or impairment. Begins in adolescence or early adulthood of prevalence, slightly over 9% of the U.S. population suffers from personality disorder. Uh, avoidant and schizoid personality disorders are most frequent, and antisocial and borderline personality disorder are most problematic. So we have cluster A, the paranoid personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, and schizo schizotypal personality disorder. Cluster B is antisocial, histrionic, narcissistic, and borderline, and then cluster C, we have avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive. So, starting off, we have borderline personality disorder, characterized by instability in interpersonal relationships, self-image and mood, as well as marked impulsivity. Symptoms uh, include cannot relate to the thought of being alone, will make frantic efforts to avoid abandonment or separation. Relationships are intense and unstable. Unstable view of self might suddenly display a shift in personal attitudes, interests, career plans, and choice of friends. May be highly impulsive and may engage in reckless and self-destructive behaviors. May sometimes show intense and inappropriate anger. Can be moody, sarcastic, differ and bitter, and verbally abusive. Uh, prevalence affects 1.4% of the U.S. Whoops, population. Sorry about that. Comorbidity, um, anxiety, mood, and substance use disorders. Then we have causes. So core personality traits, such a such as impulsivity and emotional instability show a high degree of heritability. Many individuals report childhood abuse. Next, we have antisocial. I'm just going to say the name of the first one because I don't feel like saying personality disorder a million times. Um, characterized by complete lack of regard for other people's rights or feelings. Symptoms include repeatedly performing illegal acts, lying to or conning others, impulsivity or recklessness, irritability and aggressiveness, failure to act in responsible ways, lack of remorse, overinflated sense of self, superficial charm, lack ability to empathize. Diagnosis requires individual to be at least 18 years old, and the prevalence is observed in 3.6% of the population and more common in males. That's for antisocial personality disorder. And here we have chart risk factors during adolescence that predict later violence. Uh, you have the risk factor down here, so from families, peers, and community age 10, 14, and 16. So you guys want to pause the video and check that out, but I'm going to keep moving along because there's a lot of information on these slides. It's taken me a while to get through them. So antisocial personality disorder causes. So we have genetics, 
about. So personality and temperament dimensions related to this disorder. So fearlessness, impulsive, impulsive antisociality, and callousness have a genetic influence. And uh, adoption studies suggest antisocial behavior is determined by the interaction of genetic factors in adverse environmental circumstances. Uh, emotional deficits. Individuals with antisocial personality disorder fail to show fear in response to environment cues that signal punishment, pain, or noxious uh, stimulation. Show less skin conductance, which may indicate emotional deficits. We have brain anatomy. So research has revealed less activation in brain regions involved in the experience of empathy and feeling concern for others. Greater activation in the brain area involved in self-awareness, cognitive function, and intrapersonal experience. So here are the causes. You have genetics, emotional deficits, and brain anatomy. Next, you have ADHD. Now the cause is just about ADHD. Um, neurodevelopmental disorders involve developmental problems in personal, social, academic, and intellectual functioning. Uh, ADHD is a constant pattern of inattention and or hyperactive and impulsive behavior that interferes with normal functioning. Symptoms uh, of inattention are difficulty sustaining situation or attention, failure to follow instructions, disorganization, lack of attention to detail, and they're easily distracted and forgetful. Next, you have hyperactivity, which includes excessive movement, interrupting and intruding on others, blurting out responses before questions have been completed, and difficult wait, difficulty waiting one's turn. So prevalence occurs in about 5% of children. Uh, boys are three times more likely to have ADHD than girls. Now life problems, low educational attainment, low socioeconomic status, unemployment, low wages, substance abuse problems, and relationship problems. Now causes of ADHD, uh, the genetic side, inattention, it is 71% heritable, and hyperactivity is 73% heritable, or heritable. Then we have neurotransmitters, dopamine. Genes involved are thought to include at least two that are important in the regulation of dopamine. Individuals with ADHD show less dopamine activity in key brain regions, especially those associated with motivation and reward. Medications have stimulant qualities and elevate dopamine activity. Now, brain anatomy studies show smaller frontal lobe volume and less activation when performing mental tasks. Uh, frontal lobe and hidden behavior may explain hyperactive, uncontrolled behavior of ADHD. Then we have autism spectrum disorder, so symptoms include deficits in social interaction, example, not make eye contact, turn head away when spoken to, prefer playing alone, and deficits in communication, so one-word responses, difficulty in maintaining conversation, echoed speech, and problem using and understanding nonverbal cues. And we have repetitive patterns of behavior or interest. Uh, prevalence affects approximately one in 88 children in the U.S. and five times more common in boys. Uh, genetic causes, or the genetic side of it, identical twins, 60 to 90% concordance rates, Fraternal twins, 5 to 10% concordance rates. Genes involved are those important in the formation of synaptic circuits that facilitate communication between different areas of the brain. And environment, factors that contribute to new mutations. So, for example, pollutants. And here we have the last slide, the, ch the child vaccinations and autism spectrum disorder. So if you guys didn't know, there was a big debate a while ago, and there still kind of is, um, that getting your child vaccinated, I think before the age of three, will cause them to have developed autism. And so that has been proven not correct. Um, they've done a ton of studies and there's no correlation or there's no causation, you know, just because, oh, uh, little Timmy here took a vaccine and, you know, then developed autism shortly after there's, oh, well, there's correlation, but again, that doesn't mean causation. So you guys, if you want, can check out this chart here. You have your percent of children, and then the total cumul cumulative immunogens. That's a weird way of saying it. So you have autism controls, autism controls, autism controls for different age groups. So you can see for yourself there. But anyways, that finally, it's a long chapter, but we did it, um, wraps up chapter 15, Psychological Disorders. And so I hope you guys enjoyed this chapter, found it, you know, interesting and educational. And yeah, so we only have one more chapter left. Um, we're almost there, guys. So I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in the next and final chapter. Thanks. Have a great one. Bye.